and the race for the White House shaping up to be an expensive general election battle. President Obama's re-election campaign reversed its stance against super PACs late yesterday, encouraging contributors to donate money to a group Priorities USA Action run by former administration staffers. With so much at stake, we can't allow for two sets of rules in this election, whereby the Republican nominee is the beneficiary of unlimited spending and Democrats unilaterally disarm, wrote Obama campaign manager Jim Messina in a blog post. It's time to put strict limits. In his 2010 State of the Union address, President Obama had criticized the Supreme Court ruling wiping away limits on corporate and labor union giving. The shift by the Obama team comes as super PACs backing Republican candidates and causes have seized an early financial advantage. Groups supporting Republican presidential candidates had raised more than $34 million combined by the end of last year. Another conservative super PAC, American Crossroads, has hauled in more than $18 million. By contrast, the pro-Obama PAC has brought in less than $5 million. But the president's own campaign has received more money than all the GOP contenders combined. The administration's change of heart also comes on a day when Republicans are voting in three more states. And as the leading GOP candidate, Mitt Romney, continues to lambast President Obama's record. And for more on the president's re-election bid, we turn to his senior campaign strategist, David Axelrod. David, thank you very much for joining us. First on this uh, reversal on uh, whether to encourage your donors to give money to the so-called super PACs, does this mean you don't think you can win this election based on the contributions of ordinary Americans? Well, no, we certainly appreciate the contributions of ordinary Americans. 1.3 million people have donated to the president's campaign, most of them in small uh, contributions, 98 percent of them in small contributions, and we appreciate that. What we're looking at, though, Judy, is something we've never seen before, something unleashed by that Supreme Court uh, ruling, uh, and we've seen uh, massive amounts of money coming into these uh, super PACs, and our, by our estimate and by their own, uh, their own estimate, they intend to spend upwards of half a billion dollars uh, above and beyond what the Republican nominee and the Republican uh, National Committee is going to spend in this election. And faced with that, uh, you, you know, we had, to, we had to act. The president believes deeply that these super PACs are, are, are a, a, an unwelcome development in our politics and uh, is going to continue to try and find ways to, uh, to uh, reform them up to and including a constitutional amendment. But right now, these are the rules. And the question is, are we going to have two sets of rules or are we going to have one set uh, of rules? And we, couldn't sit, we simply couldn't sit by and allow five, six, seven hundred million dollars of negative ads uh, be run against us with, with no one on the other side responding. But it was pretty clear from the outset that this was going to be the case. A lot of money was going to be raised. That being the case, why didn't the president stick? I mean, he clearly felt so strongly about this. Why did he change his mind? Judy, I don't think anybody had an idea of just how uh, much money these, uh, these super PACs uh, we're going to raise. Uh, and now, you know, we see the reality of it. They've spent more money than all the Republican candidates uh, in these primaries, over $40 million, and 99 percent of it on negative ads. And that was a little preview. That was the appetizer. You know, we're the entree. Uh, and they're going to spend uh, multiples of that uh, to try and defeat uh, the president. And uh, it, is, it is simply, uh, it is not wise and it's not, uh, it's not right uh, for us to sit by with our ha hands tied behind our back and allow that, uh, the election to be hijacked by these, by these groups. Let me ask you about the economy. There was a good report uh, that came out last Friday on jobs, the uh, unemployment rate. But a number of respected economists say they don't expect that trend to continue. Are you, in effect, David Axelrod, sort of held hostage every month to these unemployment numbers? Well, first of all, let's stipulate that uh, the most important thing isn't our link to the unemployment rate, but to the, you know, how the American people are experiencing this economy. We're fighting hard to increase. We've had 23 straight months of private sector job growth. That's accelerating. We want to continue to accelerate that because that's, that's good for our country. Uh, and obviously, uh, you know, it, it is good for us as well. Uh, but uh, and, and in terms of the economists, 
projections. I think one thing that we've learned over the course of these years is that uh, no one really has a crystal ball on these things. And I've seen more robust projections, less robust. The best thing for us to do is keep our nose to the grindstone, keep pushing, uh, keep pushing forward and taking the steps we think uh, will help accelerate the economy. Mitt Romney, uh, former governor of Massachusetts, uh, still has a primary fight on his hand, but your campaign has pretty much been treating him as the eventual nominee. Um, what, what are the strengths that you see in Mitt Romney that make you assume that he will be? Well, look, he's been a, a weak front runner from the beginning. He continues to be a weak front runner. He has far more resources than anyone else. He's run for president now twice. He's got a nas national organization. Uh, it seems like the Republican establishment has largely uh, embraced him uh, uh, in this race. So it's it's logical to assume that he he uh, you know he continues to be the, a weak front runner and that he'll, he may uh, be the nominee of the party. Uh, and we're prepared for that. He certainly uh, projects himself that way. And you know we'll we'll. we'll We'll be prepared for that debate. And and uh, and and in terms of framing the campaign at this point going forward, your major challenge is what? Uh, well, look, we're we're going to project a positive a vision for how we move forward as a country and re rebuild our not just regain the jobs we've lost, but rebuild an economy in which the middle class is growing and not shrinking, in which people who work hard can get ahead, in which people can look forward to a better future for their kids. That's how we measure progress in the economy. Uh, and there's going to be a very distinct uh, uh, difference between the way we approach it and the way the folks on the other side do, and particularly Governor Romney, who seems to believe that if we just go back to what we were doing and cut taxes for the very wealthy, uh, cut regulations on Wall Street, that somehow we'll all profit from that and the economy will grow. Well, we just tested that proposition and it failed. The administration decision to, uh, to require uh, religious uh, charities, universities and others, hospitals, to include contraceptives in the health services they provide it has created a huge firestorm in the leadership of the Catholic Church and other religious leaders. You said earlier today uh, in an interview, David Axelrod, that the administration would work with these institutions uh, to implement this policy. What does that mean? Does that mean you're prepared to give them some sort of an out? Well, Judy, let, let, let's back up and do uh, just recite a little history of how we got to where we are. Uh, the Institute of Medicine recommended to the Health and Human Services uh, Secretary Sebelius uh, that uh, contraceptive uh, uh, services be part of the package that uh, are in every uh, woman's uh, insurance uh, uh, package, ins insurance policy, as preventive care. Uh, she added an exemption for religious uh, institutions for churches and their employees. The question is, does that extend to hospitals? Does that extend to universities where uh, where many people work who aren't or aren't even Catholic? Uh, and uh, do those women get do, essentially don't do they get the same rights and the same privileges as everyone else uh, to that preventive care? And uh, you know we believe strongly that that should be the case. And in fact, that's the policy in 28 states today. So what we've said is. We're going to have a year's uh, period of time in which to transition to this, and that'll give us a chance to look at what these other, st how this is implemented elsewhere, uh, how we can, uh, how we can implement it here in the in the in the best and fairest way, but. Uh, certainly advancing the principle that uh, women deserve uh, access to contraception, uh, and uh, so the, those women, those teachers, nurses, janitors, and so on, who, who work in these institutions, uh, deserve access just like everybody else. But very quickly to clarify, are you saying there may be some exceptions? I'm, I'm saying that uh, there are models all across the country that can be emulated, including, by the way, in Massachusetts, uh, which was in place when Governor Romney was there, and in Georgia, which has no exemptions, uh, where uh, Speaker Gingrich is from. Uh, these policies have been in place. Half the, half the country has these policies, and we should be able to learn from that in implementing this and move forward. David Axelrod, senior strategist uh, to the President Obama reelect campaign, thanks very much. Good to be with you.